So love is, in this sense, eternal and it makes the lover eternal too. The one whose heart has become alive with love will never die. His name will be inscribed on the page of our eternal world. It makes one alive, truly existent, and it also makes one aware of existence as a whole, as Hafez says. The moment I perform the ablution of my body from the fountain of love, I simultaneously utter four takbirs for all that exists. So, again, the ablution, of course, is a purification process. So, the, 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 the moment I come, become purified by love, I become appreciative, I become aware of existence as a whole, and I praise God as, for existence as a whole. What are some of the main metaphors that uh, Hoff has used that we have seen? Uh, you can see he likes to use metaphors like wine, cup, uh, wine tavern, or even intoxication uh, for his poetry. Wine oftentimes as it refers to love. The cup refers to the heart in which one sees the reflection of the beloved, in other words, the cup bearer. Oftentimes also he uses the nightingale and the rose as symbols for love. The nightingale, of course, who sings to the rose because he wants the rose to open up, remain sort of unveiled, but of course the rose can remain veiled and so the nightingale will become separated or sad. The nightingale, oftentimes obviously famous for his singing, uh, it is a reflection or a representation of the heart and the rose oftentimes is a representation of the rose-colored cheek of the beloved. He also refers to um, figures in uh, sort of the, uh, amongst the prophets um, uh, and figures in the Quran and the stories like Joseph and Suleika and others and as we've seen he oftentimes refers to the path of love. So what about uh, the larger picture? How does a uh, Hafez relate to previous trends, to previous writers and poets, and so forth? His ideas are not radically new, as you can imagine. Uh, his main ideas were there amongst the predecessors, and they can can be traced back. Of course, his emphasis on love uh, as the main force in the universe and existence has many predecessors uh, who sort of held similar ideas and many people modern day scholarship trying to place him in a what should we call it a, a very kind of concept called mazhab al esh or din esh sometimes it's also called in arabic it's called din al hope which has been translated as the cult of law or the school of law or the religion of law most commonly as I said, it's a very concept that uh, sees a broad movement of literary and mystical trends in both Arabic and Persian um, writing in the medieval sort of uh, civilization as part of this. They emphasize, for example, early Arabic poetry, that is, Arabic poetry in early Islam, uh, especially sort of the longing love poetry of Audrey. Uh, of the Uri school in the 8th and the 9th century, people like Basha, uh, Ibn Mordor, Abbas, Ibn Ahnaf, who use religious language to voice their personal sentiments, to illustrate their worldly love, and in this sense they merge the worldly and the, divine, and the religious love. And they make love, or any love really, whether worldly or religious the religion itself. Later on, this idea of the religion of love uh, was apparently introduced into Persian literature, both profane and religious, and we can see it among some people like Rudaki, Nizami Ganjari, and of course, mystics like Ahmed Ghazali, Sanai, and Rumi. Hafez is seen as the peak and the conclusion to this trend, uh, in which sees love as the most central and the main force in the universe and existence. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.
Pascal, there is time for a few questions. Yes? So he um, oftentimes is supposed to have read his poetry to an audience who was intimately aware of the literary tradition, of the mystical tradition, and so forth. And he seems to have been famous in um, Shiraz at the time. But there are, of course, a number of contemporaries of Hafez, famous uh, figures uh, who are mystical poets as well, people like Khadru Kermani, people like uh, Imad Faqih um, Kermani and Solomon Savage and others who actually in many ways also reflect what Hafez says. I mean they don't say the same thing but you know they, 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 they speak about some of the same uh, topics and talk about it in similar ways. Of course Hafez is only one poet and there are a number of other poets around and he in many ways also responds to poets of his time and of course to the earlier tradition as well. Yeah. So it's it's always it's always he's always part of this tradition as well. Thank you for Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, thank you for bringing Hafez to AUC. <coughs> You're welcome. It's really great to hear about him. Uh, you know, I was wondering when you said he refers to uh, love narratives of the Quran, Zulaikha, Joseph and Zulaikha, and so on. Does he also refer to other stories like uh, Majnun Layla and uh, other things? Yeah, I mean, that's the basic statement. I mean, you have to refer to those. I mean, there's, there's references to uh, Majnun and Layla and, and, and other stories. And, 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 most of the poets at the time in Persian poetry uh, pick up those stories and, and they may even refer to earlier poets who treated uh, this, this kind of, uh, those kind of stories and so forth. So yeah, that's, it's very common. One thing that has been pointed out that is interesting actually, he doesn't refer as much as other poets, for example, to Muhammad the Prophet. Yeah, That's one thing interesting, even though he seems to identify himself as one who has memorized the Quran and even adopted it as his pen name, some people think that is a bit strange, but uh, nobody is really the wiser about you know, why this is the case. Also, can I ask another question? Uh, you know, in, in English, I mean, someone like C.S. Lewis had uh, classified different types of love, you yeah. know, so he talks about affection, friendship, eros, and caritas, yeah. divine love, and so on. I'm surprised that in Arabic uh, criticism, or they've written a lot about Aish, you know, about Hansk and so on, mm -hmm. and also in Persians, they never tried to find, you know, certain terms for certain types of loves, you know. Uh, I think uh, Abu Hamid al Ghazali uh, does quite a good job in the Iyal al I mean, that's of course not poetry and in Arabic, uh, but he does a pretty good job at, at sort of defining love, both worldly love and differences to sort of uh, love in, the, in a religious context. And he, I think he different, differentiates between at least mahabba and hope, ishq, uh, and also things like shok and so forth. But uh, half as of course being a poet is not as systematic, so it's you know it's a different. Um, but you're right. I mean there may not be many others who try to uh, differentiate, but there is quite a discussion going on not in half this time, but in the 12th and 13th century, about whether it is appropriate to use ish in the context of man and God, uh, because traditionally of course in the Quran it's Mahabha that is used, your hope uh, between man and God. And initially, a lot of people are somewhat reluctant to use Ishq because they think it refers to the sort of um, context of marriage only between man and woman. Yeah. And it's 
dragging God down into sort of this, uh, what do you want to call it, context of, of, of man uh, is, is, is dangerous to them. And so there's a lot of discussion going on about that. But eventually, it uh, is, is used a lot, especially in the Persian. Uh, so there was a question here, and then. Uh, Hi, thank you for the lecture, Mr. Sure. Asma. I hear you're very important and really happy to hear. Uh, my question is, how do you read the modern reemergence of Sufi thinking and Sufi trends in uh, today's intellectual world after many years of their absence? Um, is it kind of like a spiritual drought that's you know, come in among young youth? I mean, being a researcher in this field and delving deeply into Sufism, um, I'm, I'm quite curious, what is bringing this back? This, about what is bringing half this back? Not just half this, like the Sufi trends generally, and they're also like, worldwide accepted, not only by Muslims, but, but by many, many other people. Well, I mean, this is a very broad question, but I think there is, of course, a lot of relevance in this, and uh, I think uh, it is also applicable to a setting where you have different religious traditions um, coexisting together. I mean, he talks about love as if it was something beyond any religious tradition, as something that we could sort of unite all behind. And I think from that point of view, there's a lot of relevance to it. But there, you know, there may be other reasons um, as well. I think that the, rele the relevance was never lost, but of course it was suppressed for a while by uh, Salafi uh, trends and so forth. Um, but I think the general idea of Islamic mysticism and why it succeeds in the first place also in the medieval period is in many ways because it provides an inner kind of sphere to Islam, uh, and I think that's what makes it very valuable. Uh, there's a lot of, obviously in medieval Islam, a lot of um, early sort of focus on law, on how to conduct oneself in public and so forth, and Sufism provides an inner kind of way of, 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 of the religion. And I think from that point of view, it may also be relevant today, because it gives people an inner sphere as well, and it looks after sort of the inner, the spiritual aspect of our existence. Does that answer your question, in a way? Yes, yes. So we have one uh, last question, maybe, uh, before we go back to teaching, or... Uh, come okay, so here, this time. Hello, um, thank you for the lecture. Sure. It's really enlightening. And, um, so I know that Hafiz was fluent in Arabic, and there are some... Uh, he, he used to write also Macaronic uh, poetry, which was uh, Arabic and Persian. So was there an Arabic audience in Shiraz that he was addressing, or was this revolutionary, or was this common practice? I mean, this was very common. All of these, all of these major scholars, of course, were trained in Arabic. Hafiz is very aware of the literary tradition in Arabic. Uh, he's very well trained in this, he's trained in grammar, he's trained, of course, also in theology, in fiqh, and so forth. So, he may not speak Arabic at home, but he is, you know, his, his Arabic is very good. And I, mean, I don't think there is a medieval uh, mystic, or at least I cannot think of many who wouldn't be fluent in Arabic because they're trained in Arabic from the very beginning. About an Arabic audience in Shiraz, that I wouldn't know. But at the time, Persian seems to be the main language. That being said, a lot of people have pointed out that there are smaller communities of other people speaking uh, Turkish languages and so forth, or maybe, maybe even Arabic at the time. So it may even be that he presented some of his, um, his work in Arabic to people who were Persian native speakers, but like him were fluent in Arabic. I mean, that's also possible, but it's difficult to, difficult to know these days. So most people were fluent in both, or mostly the poets? Uh, no, I mean, people who had uh, training in religious sciences and literature, mostly. And people who were well trained. No, I, I mean, it's difficult to say how much a regular person in the street knew, uh, but all of the famous mystics and poets, uh, I would say, knew the Arabic, and they knew it well, as well. Okay, so, uh, so, okay. 
one very last, <laughs> last <laughs> short question. Yeah, Samia? Thank you, Pascal. And um, out of curiosity, because you may have this out to be non, not exceptional, that he resembled many other poets, that they said many of the things, they're not really original in any way, but my question is, why do we all know him? Uh, what makes his name? Is it translation? Is it because he's been translated into English mm -hmm. and therefore has become accessible and therefore is paraded as, you know, the uh, sort of mystical uh, poet or what? I mean, how do we explain the fact that mm -hmm. we all know that... For his fame, you mean? Well, what are the causes why, that he's so widespread and that there are other contemporaries, Hoju Kermani and others who are also highly regarded in this time, but we don't know about them that much, you mean? Yeah. Uh, well, I have to say, I mean, he, you know, the way the things are trans or transmitted and, and they transcribe and, and translated, of course, I don't think anybody would be translated in, in the sense if he wasn't already extremely well known and very popular. And Hafez is translated under the Ottomans already, and he arrives in Germany, the German kind of area in the 18th century, and Goethe even uh, devotes some time to him. So I think there is probably also his, his appeal is his poetry in many ways, his ambiguity. So there's a lot of skill in terms of his poetry, and there's also his ambiguity that a lot of people like, that you can read a verse one way or another way and so forth, and he, the, the different levels of meaning. So if you read something like Saudi, who is a, lives about 100 years before time, his time in, uh, in Shiraz, and is also a famous poet. If you read Saudi, everything is pretty straightforward. I mean, it's still not that easy to read, but it sort of all makes sense. There's only really one level of meaning. Most of this you can read, and so that's that. But Hafez has this ambiguity that I mean, is appealing to people as well. And today, of course, is the most famous poet in Iran for political circumstances, one might say. Uh, but he has has been famous in Iran, in the Iranian and the, the Indian subcontinent for many, in, uh, for many centuries. Yeah. So, what really is the, the secret of Hafez is, is a good question. I'm not quite sure I can answer this. Why he is more famous than some of his contemporaries? Okay, so uh, unfortunately we have to stop here uh, because we are going back to our classes. Thank you very much, Pascal, and thank you very much for, to all of you for being here. And I want to invite you uh, to our next Kama and Kerem uh, lecture that will be on March 18, and we have the pleasure to welcome on campus Dr. Heba Barovkar, who is head of the curatorial uh, section at the Islamic Arts Museum in Malaysia. And she will give a lecture about the Ahabes Lee Kron. So thank you very much again, and thank you very much. Pascal.